Hello and welcome to this video on oxidation. Oxidation is an issue for anyone who brews. It can turn the best fermentation into an undrinkable mess. Unfortunately, oxidation is a chemical process, and so solutions are not a way to fix it after it occurs, but something you must preemptively apply. Conversely, oxidation can turn something like a bad beer into something palatable, if not good, when left to age. Oxidation is generally considered to be something ruinous, especially when we talk about beer, but it applies to just about every brewing thing that you will do. Exposure to oxygen can occur anywhere in the process, from the very beginning to when you leave it to age. Any time when there is a mixture of oxygen and your fermentation within a bottle, you will find that oxidation occurs. Using beer as a simple example, you can tell that it's been oxidised as there will be a stale taste and it will be described differently by different people. They will often have words like leathery, papery, wet cardboard, dog smell or similar. These are all signs that the beer has been oxidised. Chemically speaking, oxidation is when oxygen on a molecular level is going to be interacting and releasing energy. This creates a chemical reaction, and that chemical reaction alters the chemicals that give your beer or other beverage its flavour. Oxygen is, after all, one of the more reactive elements on Earth. Speaking in more specific terms, oxidation is when one molecule loses an electron and it is picked up by another molecule. You may also know the acronym oil rig. Oxidation is the loss of an electron, and re is the gain of an electron. Oxidation can also be described more broadly by the electrons themselves, and every molecule has a shell of electrons around its centre. The very centre of that has two, and then up to eight in the shell around that again. When it gains one electron, it develops a negative charge. When it loses an electron, it gains a positive charge. This change in charge is that oxidation reaction occurring. When you have oxygen, it tends to develop a negative charge because it will gain electrons. Many of these things can be important, and especially this last part about it reacting with electrons, because oxygen becomes a reactive oxygen species. That means that it reacts readily with other kinds of molecules. This is one of the big reasons why beer fermentations can stall. If you are the kind of brewer that adds oxygen to your beer to help jumpstart the fermentation, you're normally adding molecular oxygen, that is two oxygen molecules together. These are relatively unreactive, but once it starts fermentation, these can turn into reactive oxygen species. When you start adding catalysts to help that fermentation go along, notably iron and copper, you can increase the reaction speed and the development of reactive oxygen species. If you are going to add these to stored beer, or they're present as a byproduct of the water you've used, or other additives, you may find that you create even more reactive oxygen species, that these will be present when you put the beer or other fermentation into storage. If you are the kind of person who will store their beer for 6 or 12 months before drinking it, that is 6 or 12 months where the reactive oxygen species can react with other things in that bottle. Hops, acids, phenols, lipids, and alcohols, all of these can be changed chemically by reactive oxygen species. This is why oxygen is so important. As a rule, oxidative reactions will always occur in your beer, regardless of how it is stored. There are ways to mitigate this, but these reactions will occur. They can be sped up with heat and motion, or by keeping them cold and still you can slow them down. Even if you are trying to store your wine in a deep dark cellar that is cold and the wine is kept absolutely stable, there will still be a near constant small amount of oxidation occurring. There is a reaction within the wine barrel. 
Going back to beer as the case study for this, oxidation will affect your beer flavour in a variety of ways. The beer that is most susceptible are those that are lightly coloured. It leads to the creation of a chemical called trans 2 noniol This is an aldehyde and it tastes like paper. While it is true that cellulose and glucose are very similar at a chemical level, you don't want the tastes being interchangeable. And when we talk about the flavour from trans 2 noniol it only takes a fractional amount, 0.1 parts per billion, to be able to become obvious to the human taste bud. That means it's a fractional amount needed to start ruining your lightly coloured beer. This can also affect the aroma of your beer. Malt is something that imparts the smell, the desirable smells, to your beer. When you begin fermenting it, it can start to produce slightly different chemical compounds. One of the important ones, and this imparts a honey-like scent, 2,3-pentanidian. And this is yet another byproduct generated through oxidation. Beers that are more resilient to that process tend to be darker. They're also affected somewhat differently. Where with a dark beer, you tend to have a dark malt, which contributes significantly to that coloration. You lose the sharper, malted edges from this, and it's replaced with a sweeter, sherry-like smell and taste. This is because the oxidation reaction helps to convert some of those malt flavours. Notably, you get a change from melanoidins, oxidised, which then become benzyl aldehydes. The conversion between these two chemicals is what leads to the change in flavour and aroma. That of course is based on the idea that your fermentation has gone well and you've put it into storage. If however you introduce oxygen after the primary fermentation, it's going to change things again. Importantly for most brewers, it's going to influence how yeast converts some of those early byproducts. The big one's going to be diacetyl. Diacetyl is something we've mentioned elsewhere, and it's one of the products responsible for the cider-like flavour in certain beers when you add the wrong sugar. This leads to the first place where you can actually start to do something about oxidation. The big way you introduce oxygen at this stage of fermenting is by the second fermentation having the ferment moved from container to container, and the second fermenter having the beer added in such a way that you aerate it, whether that's by splashing, gurgling, or otherwise causing it to become disrupted. The best way to solve this issue is to keep the siphon below the surface level of the beer going into the new container. This will help to avoid that splashing issue and mitigate most of the aeration. Another way is to decrease the difference in height between the two containers when you begin filling it. If you have already done this and unfortunately weren't aware of it before doing so, you may be getting to the stage where you're going to store your beer, and this is where storage options become important. Kegging has some advantages over other ways of storing beer in particular. If you fill the keg with CO2 before you begin filling it, you'll find that the beer that you add displaces the CO2 and it creates a blanket over the top. That layer prevents oxygen from getting into the beer while it's in the keg. This means that you will be able to avoid the issues of oxidation for the most part. If you are going to bottle your beer, unfortunately, you aren't going to have anywhere near the same kind of luck. In theory, you could try and purge any oxygen from the bottles and fill them individually, but this is a rather wasteful approach. You are going to have the best luck with two things. Again, avoid unnecessary splashing or aeration of the beer as you are bottling it, and the second is to add that little bit of sugar to carbonate it in the bottle. Bottle conditioning will convert as much of the oxygen in solution into CO2 as is possible. 
there are also oxygen absorbing caps that can be used and these are gaining some degree of popularity. It's also worth remembering that heat and movement will increase oxidation rates. So storing it somewhere cold and preferably stable will keep your beer and any other fermentation for that matter stable for longer or at least less oxidized. Going now from the very broad considerations to some very specific detail. And for this, we've decided to rely on some information from published research. And for that matter, most research in this area has looked at beer stalling. A notable feature of research into this area is that there was, for a time, a focus, a very clear focus, on the oxidation of unsaturated fatty acids. This was to the neglect of many other different reactions that occur within beer. The reason that this was the case is the aforementioned cardboard flavour of beer. With that two non reaction creating the cardboard flavour, commercial breweries had a big issue with it, and they were working extremely hard to try and figure out why it happened and how to stop it. Unfortunately for those who are trying to make beer, the way that you create these particular fatty acids is a direct result of processes that can't really be stopped. The acids are initially and primarily released as triglycerols by the activity of barley and malt lipases. This occurs during the malting process, and so unless you are malting your own barley, and even then you may not be able to stop this from happening, you have no control over it. There are further activities that occur as a result of the mashing process. That is the hydrolysis of triacylglycerols during mashing. Throughout the entire mashing process, malt lipases remain in effect, and so you get transformation of the various lipids within the malt itself, and you have no way to really stop this from happening, since you want the malt amylases to break down the malt itself. If you were to try and stop the lipases from working, you would likely result in the amylases no longer working as well. This is one of the big reasons why, in the earlier stages of your fermentation, and particularly the mashing and first fermentation, you can't really do a lot about oxidation. All you can really do to work on it is try and control it during the second fermenter and when you are bottling or kegging. In bottled beer, oxygen is important here, and it's what leads to the biggest and most pronounced changes in aroma and taste. The more oxygen in your brewing process before bottling or kegging, the shorter the shelf life of your beer will be. Minimizing the amount of reactive oxygen species in this final step, the biggest way you are going to be able to do anything about this. Commercially, there are efforts towards being able to use transitional metals, copper and iron primarily, as electron donors so that the contents of the beer itself doesn't get affected and the metals effectively interact with the oxygen and negate it. For the home brewer, bottled beers will become oxidized over time. It's very much a matter of being aware of this, taking steps to minimize it yourself with cold and stability, but also being aware that some beer styles will have more impact to them than others. Notably how we mentioned earlier, the lightest beers are affected more than the darkest beers but there are of course always going to be outliers and exceptions to that rule. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, please consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions that you have below.